get started. I'm going to uh, read chapter 24. Our text is actually Isaiah 24, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read a few more verses than that. Isaiah 24. prophet writes, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry-hearted do sigh. The mirth of tabret ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. They shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down, every house is shut up, that no man may come in. There is a crying for, for wine in the streets, all joy is darkened, the mirth of the land is gone. And the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree, and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, My leanness, my leanness, woe unto me! The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we, Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we see what a solemn word it is, word of judgment upon this earth. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you would send your Son that he 
he would bear our judgment. That those whom you loved from eternity, you put in your Son, Jesus Christ, to, to bear their sin, to bear their judgment, to put it away forever, and to reconcile us to holy God. And Lord, we thank you for this. Father, we thank you for gathering us together here tonight to hear your word. Lord, that you would be merciful to this people, that you would heal our hearts and our minds and our thoughts, that you would set our hearts and minds and thoughts upon our Savior Jesus Christ, and that he would heal us and gather us together to himself, and that you would speak comfortably to us and peaceably and give us rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us a patient spirit while we wait for you to deal with the wicked of the earth and bring them to judgment for their works and their sin and their hatred against you. And Lord, keep us ever looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and not be deceived with the deception that is upon their dark hearts. And Lord, we pray for our brethren here, that you would minister to their needs, and Lord, that you would minister the word to our hearts, that you would bring us together under the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we would be one in him, and that you would be pleased to keep this body, Lord, and that you would be pleased to fill us with your spirit you would be pleased to reveal your Son, Jesus Christ, to each of us, that we would hear his voice, that we would follow the shepherd, and that we would rejoice in him. Lord, you know the, the weaknesses that we have and the, the sicknesses that, that we suffer. Lord, that you would heal our bodies and heal our minds, that you would bring everyone back here together again, once again, together as one body in Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would be merciful to our children and those whom we love, our friends and family that we love and, and try to speak to and that we pray for. Lord, that you would be merciful to them, that you would give them a hearing ear and that you would give them faith. and Reveal yourself to them. Give them the light and the revelation which you've given to us of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that you fixed our hope in him. Lord, would you, would you please fix their love and their hearts in him as well, that you would deliver your people from the coming judgment upon the wicked of this earth. Lord, help us to see, to see our Lord, to see what you are doing, to see your, your will, and Lord, that you would turn our hearts to Pray that your will be done, and not ours, but your will. Father, we pray now for the service tonight, that you, your spirit would be among us, and that you would be pleased to teach us and help us to hear. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in Christ's name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, Joe. Let's stand and sing number 40, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Number 40, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Morning by 
morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. If you would, turn to 272, the solid rock. 272. Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, fall less to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you.
read uh, Psalm 26 tonight. Psalm 26. <clears throat> Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in 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 an so I will compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, and tell of all the wonders tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. In those hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you thankful this evening that we do have a place to come to thy house, Father. A place to come and to hear the gospel. And Father, we're thankful for the man that you've sent to bring that message. And Father, we ask that you use him and give him the words that you'd have us to hear. And Lord, we ask that you open our, our eyes and ears, Father, and our hearts to hear the message and to see what you're trying to show us and feel it in our hearts. And Father, we just ask that you watch over and care for us as you watch over and care for our pastor. In Christ's name. Okay, brethren, good to see you all. All right, we'll be in Isaiah 24, and tonight we're just going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 24, verses 1 through 4. Now, I read at the beginning, I, I read this chapter because it strikes a very solemn note when you read it. it it's very solemn, and when you read it, it reads largely in the present tense. Right? You read it, and it's very present in its delivery. And why that is is because it's very, it 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 covers all the judgments that man has ever witnessed. It it reveals, it it shows God's hand in every major judgment that man has seen it easily shows shows that and yet even though it fits so well in in past judgments we see how it is very fitting in describing that judgment which is to come in that great and final day the day of judgment when Christ comes and so it's a fitting word for the coming judgment of every man woman and child outside of Christ in Acts 17, at the end of verse 30, when the apostle was there declaring the unknown God to those Greek philosophers, he said to them, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Even now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And that is, we're to be turned from our vain religion, the idolatry that is so common to us the worship and praise of ourselves the worship and praise of some false god according to some dead religion that that we trust in that we've heard of and have followed and think that it's going to speak well for us but god sent his own darling son to be the very righteousness of his people to put away sin 
for his people. And in Christ's coming, it reveals to us our, our need of salvation, our need of repentance, that we cannot save ourselves by our own works. And he goes on and says, Because God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And so Paul's telling us we're to be look to Christ, be turned to Christ. Hear what we're declaring to you that God has sent his son for a purpose because man cannot save himself and all men are going to be judged by this God and we know this because God has raised this one from the dead. He's declared that this is the one in whom he's pleased and by that same power that he raised Christ up so we too will be raised to stand before God those in Christ and those outside of Christ and those outside of Christ will have to stand there naked and ashamed in their own works trusting what they've done so the prophets of God have foretold of the judgment day over the course of man's history over the course of history they spoke of judgment before Israel was even a nation they spoke of judgment while Israel was a nation and they continue to declare that there's judgment coming now that that nation of Israel is no more now that we're in the day of grace Christ's Christ's reign Christ's church in his day we yet know that there is a coming judgment day for all men and women. All right, so the reality is the Lord has been speaking of judgment the whole existence of, of man, pretty much. And so man is without excuse. He's heard that God is going to judge all men according to righteousness, according to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is the very righteousness of God. Now, the thing is, is that our God has revealed himself in mercy, right? He's revealed to us. He's foretold us of the coming judgment and given us a heart and a will and a desire to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ for safety. That's mercy. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And he says in verse 7, that the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And the apostles are telling us this because they want us to know and be assured that God shall punish his enemies. And his enemies are our, our enemies because they hate those whom God loves, and they hate those who love the true and living God and speak and declare his name. And so while it's a fearful thought, the judgment of God is a fearful thought for us who fear God, who, who know him and see him and behold his glory and power, we have this blessed assurance. The apostles comforted us with these words. Paul said to the Thessalonians in five, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. And what the Lord reveals to us is that we're saved by grace, not by our works. He doesn't threaten us and say, now I'm coming. You better start doing right and you better start doing all things perfect and well without fault and be perfect or else you're going to be suffer that same judgment no he tells us we must be righteous and perfect but he tells us where we are made righteous and perfect in the lord jesus christ not looking to the law not looking to our own our own works but but looking to the lord jesus christ and we find that it's all of his power and grace and mercy that draws us brings us into the family of God. It's all through the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Ephesians 1, verse 11. We'll see this. Ephesians 1. <clears throat> Paul 
Paul has been speaking of the adoption that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We that are his people that have heard his voice and follow him as our shepherd, we are adopted into the family of God. And he now says in Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That's God the Father who first trusted Christ. He, he trusted his people in the hands of Christ and put us there. In whom, verse 13, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or the down payment that Christ has given to us of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Speaking of that time when Christ will return to the earth and raise up our bodies to ever be with the Lord in the heavens. Now, this is a glorious and a happy day for the children of God. But what is to become of the wicked? We know from the psalmist, Psalm 711, that says that God is angry with the wicked every day. He's angry with the wicked every day. And so he's going to destroy this world and all the wicked of this world when he destroys this, this world. But the remnant has this most glorious promise that his judgment day, his, he's already been judged in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God has already put us in Christ and we've been judged in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our ark. and God put us in him. And God poured out his wrath upon his son. So that you and I who believe and hope in him. Have no confidence in this flesh. We, you and I looking to Christ. We're in Christ. By, saved by the mercy and the grace and the kindness of God. Shown to us in Christ. And so that he bore that wrath. And he bore the judgment of God being poured out upon us. And he took it all and suffered under the wrath of God that we who hope in him will not have to pay that debt. There's no more debt for us to pay. Christ paid it all in full with the shedding of his blood. And that's why Paul assures us, saying, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So when we're reading Isaiah 24, this chapter, I can't tell you that these words only have a spiritual meaning can't say that, that, that that's all that we'll see. You certainly, we certainly do see the spiritual fulfillment of this in Christ. But when you look at every judgment that's ever, ever been in, in, in man's history, it always dealt with their physically being judged and, and, and being brought into, into ruin. We see horrific judgments being poured out upon men which caused them great pain and great trouble and, and brought them to great ruin and, and just wiped out everything for them. But we also see throughout history the Lord's mercy and grace toward his people because the Lord has always had a remnant that he loves and has separated out for himself and has shown them mercy and, and, and brought them through it because we know this because he always had, had a witness of what he's done and how he saved them, and how he destroyed the enemies of God. So, unlike the wicked for whom these judgments come, we're reminded of the repeatedly of the blessings that come for the righteous. It says in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And that first resurrection is the believer's part in Christ now when the Lord reveals Christ to them and, and reveals salvation to them, giving them faith to look to Christ, to lay hold of Christ, to trust him and believe that faithful work which Christ did for his people, to know that he has saved them to the uttermost. That's the first resurrection. And he says, they've no fear of the second death. 
Now, the first death is when we lay these bodies down in the grave. We all die and, and, and go back to the dust. But it's the second death that we have no fear or worry of because Christ already put away that death. He destroyed death so that we won't be held with death. And when all the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, that, that'll be their part. That's the second death that we don't have to worry or, or fear. Right, because it, it speaks of that in Revelation 21, 8, when it says, But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's that second death that he's talking about there. All right, now, this week and next, we'll look at... at this chapter in order to understand, you know, gain an understanding of the judgment of God against the wicked. But we'll see, believers will see, how that in Christ, that judgment's been fulfilled and that they have nothing to fear or worry about in, in that regard. You keep looking to, to Christ. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ and, and he'll sustain you and keep you through it so that you bear the fruit that he has purposed for us to, to bear in him. Trust the Lord God because he knows the wicked. He knows how the wicked trouble us. He knows how, how they, their, their works of darkness and the evil that they cause. And he knows how to deliver his people out of, of those works. All right, our title is Empty Works. Empty Works. And we'll look at first the empty works of man. And then at the very end, we'll see the purpose of God in Christ. All right, so the empty works of man. Now, I'm going to read verse 1, and we'll focus largely, largely on the first half of that verse, and then we'll look um, as we go through the rest of the chapter next week. We'll see more of the second half of verse 1. All right, so Isaiah 24 and verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Now, when I read this chapter several years ago, I've thought about this chapter a lot, and I was struck with the, the silence of the chapter. Just the si it was, it was a very, it's a very solemn chapter, and you can hear the silence. There's so few men left in the earth that it's very silent, and, and it's just a terrifying thought. It's a very solemn chapter, and you see the awesome power and the authority of God to do this, this work. The psalmist wrote, Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And one thing about the word of the Lord is its, its timelessness. It's very, it's timely, and it is always appropriate. It's, it's a timeless word, and it's suitable for the church in her age, the age that we, the local church, find ourselves in. God's word is always suitable to that time. Paul wrote to the Romans, saying in, in 11.5, Even so then, at this present time, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's always a remnant. God always has a remnant. Right? When Elijah saw the great, terrible time in, in his day, when it seemed like everybody was a worshiper of Baal, the Lord to told him, No, I have 7,000 whom I've reserved for my name that have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000. And when, when John, the Apostle John, wrote Revelation, he wrote it to seven churches. Seven churches. Right? It's, not, it's not a lot, it's not a lot, it's few, but it's always a perfect, always a complete number whom the Lord has reserved for himself. And so she finds herself in this age, and the Lord has a purpose for the church in her age, and that is for her to be faithful to her Lord, be faithful to the Lord, reverence the Son of God, look to him, seek him, worship him. Trust him. Seek the Lord to love him and be thankful for 
the grace and the mercy which God shows to you through his son, Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. Love him. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the face of this impending or promised judgment, we're told who does this work. We're told who the one is that is bringing this judgment upon the earth. It says, verse 1 there, Behold the Lord. The Lord. The Lord does this work. All these things come to pass because, verse 3 says, The Lord hath spoken this word. The Lord is doing this. The Lord is bringing judgment upon the earth. Now, Romans 8.28, Paul tells us, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We have that promise. All things work together for good according to his promise. All right, and so God ever has a purpose in the things that he does, and what he does is for the good of his people. Therefore, we do well to remember the promises of God given to us throughout the scriptures. We saw in Isaiah 3, verses 10 and 11, and we've quoted it several times that we've been going through Isaiah because Isaiah is speaking of difficult times, of times of judgment that are consistently happening to the church throughout their age at the time when they're going through. And in those verses it says, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. And that reward is that reward of sin, of, of judgment rather, for their sin, for their hatred and rebellion against God, because that's the wages of sin, death, death. They'll be judged because they're sinners that have no love, no fellowship, no, no cleansing, no covering, no blood to cover their sin. They'll pay for their own sins. All right, so the chapter, Isaiah 24, verse 1, begins, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste. It's the emptiness of the earth, and it's being made waste. And this makes clear to us what it's showing to us. He, the Lord's showing us the emptiness, the vanity of man's works. All the things that man labors in and works for and builds up for himself and glories in, and in an instant, the Lord makes it empty and wipes it all away. And it's the vanity of man. So that we see here that, that man is always looking to build up, always looking to strike out on his own and to be free from God and to do what he will. And he thinks that it'll be a glorious good time. And that he's going to do well and succeed in what he's purposing to do. And, and, and it, but it all has nothing to do with God. He wants God out of his thoughts, out of his mind. He wants nothing to do with God. And it began in the garden. right? And the Lord told Adam, when Adam sinned against God and said, I'm going to know the difference between good and evil. I can be like God. I, can, you know, I hear what the serpent's saying. I can be like God. And the Lord said to him, Immediately in that day, he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And then in the next verse, he said, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And then in the next verse, he said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And so man toils and labors for his work, and he's, he's, he's building it up. Sometimes we see how men and women build up these great kingdoms and they have all these goals and, and, and what they want to do with, with their kingdom and they die, they perish, they fall away and, and so do their ideas and what they wanted. Someone else takes over for them and they take it another direction and they go another way. So when that, that person dies, all their, their goals and what they endeavor to do die with them. And others... Still, they, they, they work and, and they labor and they try to do what, what they can, but something comes and wipes it out and destroys it. Right? There's floods that wipe away things and there's fires and, and damaging winds and hail and thieves break in and things fall apart from old age and, 
and, and all sorts of things that just come and take away and destroy the works of man. And you see this throughout the various judgments that are listed here in the scriptures. I, I'll just name a few. You know, there's the, the flood of Noah. That wiped away everything. That just took away everything there with the flood. And then there was Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're off doing their own thing. And the Lord rains down fire and brimstone and destroys those cities. Right? When, uh, when Israel was leaving Egypt and the Lord brought them into the land of Canaan, how about those people who had farms and houses and cities that they built up in their lives? And that all was taken away and given to the Israelites. So all their works weren't even theirs. They were taken away in an instant and they were removed. They had to flee or died or became slaves of the Israelites. All right, and then you see the captivity that Israel and Judah went through a number of times in, in their existence. And then we had just seen all the burdens that the Lord spoke of by the prophet. All those burdens where you see cities and nations rising and falling. And we see it all through the history of the scriptures, these you know, kingdoms and nations rising and falling, coming and going, and just, just coming to nothing. I mean, there are cities to this day that were once great and flourishing that aren't even inhabited now anymore. And so there's that. And then, of course, there's the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So they're not even uh, the nation that, that they once were. They're nothing. They're just a political nation over there but they're not the people of God. They're not the Israel of God anymore. That, that, that has been done away with. And our Lord said in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so the Lord, he judges the earth, and it's to punish sin, and it's to bring an end to the works of wicked men. And so it doesn't matter who you are, all men are transgressors. Every one of us is a transgressor. Every one of us is a sinner. None of us can boast that we're better than, than the person next to us. We're all in need of God's mercy and grace. And verse 2, in Isaiah 24, verse 2, it says, And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. And so the Lord, we see here, is that the Lord's not impressed with the state with our stature, right? With what we've obtained and, and risen to in our lives. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It really doesn't matter to the Lord. It doesn't matter whether you have a position of authority or you're just the lowest servant on the, the totem pole. The Lord's not impressed with those things. All are sinners. All are guilty of sinning and breaking the law of God. And so the Lord humbles men. He humbles them. And it's to show them that they're not God. We're not God. We're not free, though we think we are. He's God. And he's our creator. And he's our lawgiver. And he's the one who tells us that we're to worship him and look to him alone. And so he's showing us our need of salvation. He's showing men that, look, you're, you think that you can just strike off on your own and that you don't need God. But I'm your provider. And I'm your sustainer, he's saying. You can do nothing apart from God. He could strike us down with sickness or illness or, or anything at any moment, and we had, we'd have nothing. He could take it all away in an instant, and we'd have nothing. And so the Lord shows us, one of the ways that he shows us and humbles us and brings us low is to show us the emptiness of, of our works and, and how quickly our works come to nothing, how they're just just drawn out of anything that, that's good or, or lasting. All right. Now Isaiah 24 verses 3 and 4 says, The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. 
so that apart from Christ, we'll toil, we'll labor, we'll build things up, and we'll think that we've accomplished something, but they're all vanity and they all come to nothing. And they won't speak well for us when we stand before God. We're not going to be able to boast in those works that we've done, whether it's something in the earth just to enrich, enrich ourselves and to get us things that we like having, or if it's some works of righteousness, some, some religious works that we think God is pleased with these. You know, he'll bring them to nothing and show us the emptiness of those things. And it's the pride of man. It's the pride of man that keeps him from seeking God. It's the pride of man that, that, that causes him to shut his ears up and not want to hear from the Lord and not want to hear that he's a sinner, not want to hear that what he does day in and day out is sin against the true and living God. And so all his ways perish with him. And it says, you know, in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so the Lord shows himself to, to, to be the Lord, to be the God, to, to be the creator of all on, on this earth. And he shows himself in judgment. He, he reveals it to men's hearts and shows them that God is judging them for their sin and they don't even lay it to heart. Many don't lay it to heart. Some might think it to a degree, but usually they find some you know, cute way of saying, oh, Mother Nature's upset with us now and she's unleashed her fury. They'll gladly blame it, you know, attribute it to Mother Nature, but never to God. And anytime someone suggests the Lord is judging those people there, they get very upset and very offended by that. It could be Mother Nature, but they, you can't say it's, it's God doing that. And really, there's only one reason why man isn't entirely wiped out and destroyed. And that's because God has a people. He has a people that he loves and that he's determined to be gracious to and determined to draw them out of their darkness, to make them his trophies of grace. And so he's bringing all these things to pass. The wicked, they don't lay it to heart. They don't understand. But his people, they'll be humbled by it. And they'll see and know the Lord's hand is in this. The Lord's hand's in this. He's doing this. It's, it's the Lord who's bringing it to pass. It's the word of the Lord that's done this. And I'm humbled. And Lord, what can I do? You know that I'm a sinner. You know I have nothing. And he brings his people low in themselves to see that, that we're nothing. And to see our need of him. Because he won't let us go off with the wicked of this world. He won't let us Go back into the, that city of the whore of Babylon. He'll keep us from going there. Your feet may turn that way in the flesh, but the Lord will always bring you back to seek your all, to find your all in him. And it's in mercy. Even if it's judgment against this flesh, it's all in mercy when he turns us to the Lord, to see and to know our all is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you look at, at Isaiah himself, back in Isaiah chapter 6, you could turn there, there in, in Isaiah 6. If you remember, that's where Isaiah saw the Lord sitting enthroned there, glorious with his robe, filling all the, 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 the court where he was, and he was, it was a glorious, powerful sight. But what had happened there? Well, at that time, remember, Isaiah started his ministry when Uzziah was the king. Uzziah was Isaiah's cousin. He was very close to his cousin, his cousin Uzziah. And Uzziah started off as a, as a great king. He was a, a godly man. He, he did things in the name of the Lord, and he sought the Lord for, for a long time. And then it was towards the end of his reign where, when he became puffed up and proud in himself, and he began to do that which was wicked and, and not right before the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord humbled him by striking him with leprosy. And he wasn't healed from that leprosy. He had to resign as king. His son took over as king, and he had to go outside of the city as any common leper would do. He was thrust out from the people, and that really affected Isaiah. Isaiah had a lot of confidence and loved his cousin and was so thankful for his cousin, and he was humbled. Isaiah himself was humbled seeing the humbling of Uzziah, and it caused him to see the Lord God high and lifted up, not his cousin, but to see it's God who rules and reigns over the hearts and wills of men. And so he was humbled 
And it says, it says in relation to what we're looking at now in Isaiah 24, but he asked the Lord in, in 611, Lord, how long? How long am I going to be preaching this to the people? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So you see here that when the Lord strips down a people, when he brings a nation low, when he brings a people low, it's for that holy seed. It's to, it's to bring out that which is precious, that gold, that silver, that, that refined precious metal that the Lord, that his people, it's to bring out his holy seed, his people, and draw them out of their darkness, draw them out of the pit with all the wicked, it's to bring them out to seek the Lord God, to seek the living God and to stop seeking their own works and to, and to stop trusting in themselves. So it's for their benefit, the glory of the Lord and the benefit of his people. All right, they're going to hear. All right, now, that was the, the empty works of, of man. Now, let me just touch a little more in closing on the purpose of God in Christ. So we've been looking at the works of man and the emptiness, the vanity of his works. And so it's God who removes the things that man trusts him, right? Just like we saw with the burdens, Israel was trusting in all these wonderful nations around her. She was very impressed with all these mighty kingdoms and kings and nations around her. And he, he took them all away. He took away the glory and the power and the majesty of, of um Nebuchadnezzar and, and Babylon, of the Egyptians, he took that away, of Tyre over here, he took that away, of all these other nations, you know, whatever Moab had and, and, and Jordan and all these other places, he, he took, he stripped it. So they had nothing to trust in but the Lord. They could only look to the Lord. And so the Lord does that. And, and so that's what we see in, in the hand of the Lord. But let me take you to an account of the prophet Jonah. Turn over to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. You know, if you go to Daniel and then Hosea, what is it, Amos and Joel, it's not too far there. It's pretty early. <laughs> pretty early in there. But, you know, Jonah's in, in, in a ship with these men, and Jonah's disobeying the Lord. He's fleeing from the Lord, he's not doing what he's been called to do, but of course the Lord's going to bring him to, to do it. But there's these men that are in the ship with Jonah, and the ship's in such a storm that these seafaring men who know the, the, the seas, who know what it is to sail, they're terrified, because they see this is, a, this is a, a terrifying, vicious storm that even they're not used to seeing, and they are certain that they're going to die and they find out that it's because Jonah is fleeing from the Lord. And so Jonah tells them, if, you're, if you want this sea, this raging wrath that's come uh, from the Lord, if you want that to be quiet and still, throw me into the ocean and then it'll be peaceful to you. But instead, this is what they do in Jonah 1, 13. Verse 13 there, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. And that verse there is a good picture of our works as men and women. It's our works, our labor. We labor hard. We don't want to hear what God says. We don't want to hear that, that look to Christ, trust him. I've sent him for this purpose. We don't want to hear that. We want to do our thing. We want to do our works. We want to do it our way, even if it's hard and laborious and trying and, 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 and destroys us. That's what man is going to do. And, and just like these, these men, these seafaring men that rode hard to bring it to land, but they couldn't. The wrath of God was too fierce, too strong, too great for them to prevail against it. It wouldn't happen. 
And so when Jonah was eventually thrown into the sea, what do we read in verse 15? It says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And that there, Jonah there, is a picture of Christ, our Savior. And God provided Christ, that he would be the very perfection of his people, that he would fulfill all the righteousness there in the law, because we can't do it. But Christ came, and he fulfilled it perfectly before the Father, and he went to the cross. And there entered into that raging sea of wrath, of God's wrath, that tempestuous wrath, which we can't work ourselves across. We can't get across this, this sea of judgment against us. Our strength, our works will never prevail for us. But Christ prevailed for us. And he bore that wrath and judgment and went into that sea, just like Jonas was cast into the sea, so Christ went into that judgment of God and bore the darkness and the fierce wrath of Almighty God against him because he was bearing the sin of his people to pay that debt, to put away the sin of his people by the shedding of his own blood. And he obtained justification. He made reconciliation. He atoned for our sins so that now we are reconciled to God and that sea is now a sea of glass. And that sea, that's what it pictures, that sea of glass before the throne of God, that in Christ, God is at peace with us. And it's still and quiet. So that all the works of man are emptied out. All that raging and wrath of man and what he's trying to do is all removed and taken away. And there's only us standing before the living God, made faultless to stand before his throne by the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that has obtained mercy and grace and peace and everlasting life with him. All right, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10, Paul says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So we're thankful, brethren, that it's not, it's not by our works of righteousness which we have done, as Paul said to Titus, but it's according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the Spirit washes us in the blood of Christ, regenerates us, giving us life, enabling us to see what Christ has accomplished for us, that he was judged for us, that we would not have to bear that judgment in the end of days when the wicked are judged, it's, they'll be destroyed, but we won't have to fear that second death. And whatever judgment comes upon this earth that, that we may be called to, to endure, to live through, or to die, in, not in the judgment, but if it pleases the Lord that we die during that time, you don't need to fear because it's the Lord's hand that, that does it. And he will always work good for his people. He'll, through that, whatever it is, the Lord will call us to himself and we'll we'll have that sweet blessed blessed fellowship with God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost through it all. He'll keep us and 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 bring forth those fruitful works like it talked about there, you know, with the oak tree and and the teal tree and then we'll see later in this chapter where it speaks of the grapes and the figs, the olives rather, that, that, that we bear, that we feed upon, those works, the Lord has a purpose in it all to bring forth those glorious works which he's ordained that we should walk in before the foundation of the, of the world, all in Christ. So, all right, I've spoken long enough. I pray the Lord will bless that to your heart. And we'll come back. Again, I don't want you to be fearful of the judgment, but to look, to see how Christ has has put us in himself and carried us through that judgment and it'll all be well for us. All right, brother. Our gracious Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, we thank you that you will not let our enemies, your enemies and our enemies, Lord, you will not let them prevail and you will not let them 
go unpunished, but you will deal with them in your perfect time. And Lord, we know that you have a, a way, a purpose for your church in every age. And Lord, we trust and know that you have a people yet to be called out, yet to hear the voice of the Son of God, yet to know that he is their shepherd. And Lord, help us. Help us now, even now, to be faithful, to preach and declare the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, in your power, as it pleases you, you would send that word out and that you would attend that word with your spirit and bring it home to the hearts of your people. Deliver them from death and darkness. Deliver them from the pit that is reserved for the wicked. And call us to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray and rejoice and give thanks. Amen. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace 236. And when 